So, um, on behalf of uh, the community of democracies, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you to the latest Lent webinar. Uh, and uh, my name is Maria Leisner. I am the Secretary General of the Community of Democracies, and, um, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Um, the LEND, or Leaders Engaged in New Democracies, is an initiative that drives democratic transition uh, by investing in future leaders. Uh, it serves as a platform for, ex uh, for exchange of knowledge um, and um, uh, between experienced leaders from democratic countries and uh, promising leaders from states currently undergoing transition. And the LEND has already organized several online um, uh, webinars, which can be actually watched through your YouTube. Um, uh, and this webinar in particular will uh, discuss human rights protection in cyberspace uh, from a civil society perspective. And all uh, online viewers are welcome to put uh, question, post questions in comments or emailing them to land um, um, at community dash democracies.org. Uh, let me, uh, before giving you the introduction, also um, uh, get to know the three wonderful invited experts on the topic. Uh, Ion Manole is our LEND member and director of Romalex Association. You're welcome, uh, Ion. Uh, you. And uh, you, um, um, it is an organization organizing to advance democracy in the Republic of Moldova, including in the Transnistrian region, uh, and um, uh, promoting and defending human rights, monitoring democratic processes, and strengthening civil society. Uh, we also have Leonid Litra, a LEND member, and a senior research fellow at the Institute of World Policy. It's lovely to have you here with us, uh, uh, Leonid. No. And uh, then uh, the third uh, invited expert is uh, Zach Lapel, uh, legal advisor at the International Center for Nonprofit Law. Uh, we're very honored to have the presence of, uh, of uh, ICNL here with us at the seminar. And um, uh, thank you so much for your availability. Thank uh, you. Welcome, Zach. Um, so uh, let me first uh, then introduce the topic. Um, and uh, uh, in recent years, uh, information and communication technology, uh, as well as human rights spheres, um, have been increasingly dominated by debates on state surveillance practices. Legal frameworks surrounding those practices, uh, as well as the issues of um, lawful data interception, um, are um, often ambiguous and cause a gradual close down of the digital space for civil society. Many countries uh, did introduce restrictive legislations, uh, greater monitoring of social networks, as well as new technologies to increase surveillance. Uh, we're all aware that technology creates both new opportunities for civil society organizations, but also threats. Uh, on the one hand, it's easier to mobilize people uh, and to share and seek information through the use of new technologies. Uh, but uh, new te technologies can also, of course, serve to carry and uh, carry out intrusive outside of civil society organizations. Certainly, governments are responsible for ensuring protection of their citizens. And uh, for security reasons, governments, of course, have the right to undertake a number of activities. Uh, they, however, need to be both uh, legal and proportional and necessary uh, in a, a democratic society. And this is exactly where the interpretation and assessment diverges between states, on the one hand, and civil society activists working uh, to ensure respect for human rights, on the other hand. Um, to contribute to this discussion, the Community of Democracy's Working Group uh, on um, Enabling and Protecting Civil Society uh, has uh, uh, organized a side event during the Human Rights Council in March in Geneva. Uh, on digital rights and enab enabling of the civil society that addressed uh, the issue of how to protect human rights in the digital realm. Uh, this is particularly important to discuss, especially at this time when the civic space, including digital space for society, is closing down. There's a need to identify and analyze threats to democracy and human rights, in particular uh, freedom of expression and privacy that uh, affect the security of civil society uh, arising from uh, the use um, uh, of uh, 
ICT, and in particular bulk surveillance by states. Uh, one thing is sure, human rights activists uh, using, for example, encryption, uh, the most important privacy preserving technology uh, we have, and uh, one that is uniquely suited to protect against bulk surveillance. They certainly should not be targeted by the government solely because of the use of that technology. We need to find a way to target their attacks against individuals as only uh, uh, then we can ensure that society is protected. Of the 19 principles of the Warsaw Declaration, to which 106 states signed up in, two, in the year 2000, the, the principle four highlights uh, the right of every person to freedom of opinion and um, of expression, including uh, the right to exchange and receive ideas uh, and information through any media. Principle 8 stresses the right of every person to uh, respect for private family life, uh, home corresponding, including, and this is explicitly written in the principle, including electronic communications, uh, uh, free of arbitrary or unlawful interference. And then we have principle number 9, uh, the right uh, of every person to freedom of peaceful assembly and association, including, of course, the right to establish or join uh, their own political parties, uh, civic groups, and other organizations with the necessary legal guarantees to allow them to operate freely. And finally, there is also principle 19 that stresses that uh, all human rights are to be promoted and protected. So the Warsaw Declaration that you can find on our website, of course, um, actually has a number of principles that are very, very relevant and these principles uh, have a wide level of recognition, even though it is not uh, internationally a legal document, it is still a uh, political commitment by, uh, by more than 100 states to respect. Uh, according to the Freedom on Net, uh, on the Net report uh, from Freedom House uh, from last year, internet freedom uh, of the world is increasingly, uh, is constantly declining as more governments are censoring information of public interest um, while surveillance has globally been on the rise. Uh, and more and more government, uh, prompted uh, mostly by security concerns, naturally uh, against the background of increasing uh, terrorism and conflict, um, they are introducing laws and measures that have the ultimate effect of restricting space in the digital realm. Over the past year, out of 65 assessed countries around the globe, uh, only 18 could be considered free, and 32 have experienced an overall decline of uh, internet freedom. The following elements um, uh, continue to this overall decline in internet freedom. Uh, first, legal requirements being used to stifle internet freedom, including national security laws. Secondly, widespread content censorship, for example, uh, criticism of, of authorities, corruption, satire, uh, and LGBT or ethnic or religious minority issues. Um, and thirdly, increased use of surveillance laws uh, and technologies, including um, by, by democracies, uh, such as, for example, the United uh, Kingdom, uh, France, Australia, and Italy, to mention a few countries that are increasingly using surveillance laws. And for uh, governments uh, targeting um, of encryption and anonymity, uh, for example, by stigmatizing its use as a tool uh, for terrorists. And uh, fifthly, uh, the fact that there are increased arrests and intimidation of users, including regular citizens and teens, uh, and stiff sentences, very lengthy prison terms. Uh, one of the recent examples um, is um, uh, uh, the case of Moldova, um, where there was a proposal um, in March this year uh, to make an amendment to the law of intelligence and security service. This would provide for board monitoring rights in the cyberspace to the detriment of the principles governing the protection of privacy um, and freedom of expression. And according to government claims, the draft law uh, was introduced for greater protection of its citizens. Uh, it's yet to be put under parliamentary uh, debate, 
Uh, but uh, it has already um, uh, created concerns and debate nationally. And this has been brought to the attention of the event uh, through one of uh, our speakers today, uh, uh, Ian Mamelin. So um, both Ian and Leonid and Zach are um, uh, very welcome uh, to, to this discussion. And I would like to uh, start with uh, asking uh, Zach um, um, uh, to, um, um, uh, to perhaps uh, if you could identify what global trends uh, there are in legislations that diminish uh, digital civic space um, uh, and, um, um, and the relationship between state surveillance and citizen protection, freedom of expression. Zach, please. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lesnar. It's a pleasure to be here today. And Thank you, the Community of Democracies, and Len specifically for inviting me to participate. Um, your introduction touched on a lot of the same points that I was going to talk about, um, but I will talk about uh, briefly three trends I'm seeing, or that we're seeing globally. Um, the first is, as you mentioned, an enactment of cybercrime laws that go beyond the scope of direct uh, prevention of activities on the internet and expand into freedom of expression and freedom of association. The second global trend is a push to limit or ban the use of encryption and the stigmatization of using encryption that goes along with it. And the third global trend, I think, is more of a call. It's a need for education of the average internet user and the regular citizen to know what freedom of expression and the right to privacy mean online and how their domestic laws comply with or contradict with international norms in this area. And I think civil society is well placed to take a leading role on that education front. Uh, so moving back to the first global trend of an enactment of cybercrime laws, almost every country follows the same sort of playbook. Um, they propose legislation to combat cybercrime laws. They invoke the fear of hacking, of organized crime, of terrorism, and pornography, which all makes sense. We don't want those activities taking place in the real world or in the digital realm. However, they then slide in a number of provisions that are broadly written and have the effect of restricting speech and the right to privacy, and in some cases even the right to assemble or associate online. These provisions make it much easier to identify critical voices online. These provisions often allow for authorities without judicial supervision to collect, surveil large amounts of data. Um, and then certain individuals or groups, due to their activities online, are thrown in jail often for defamation or other similar unsubstantiated crimes. And what we end up with is legislation that doesn't just protect cybercrime, but it's one that restricts the freedom of expression and the right to privacy. So when these cybercrime laws are introduced, it, I think it's very important to go through them provision by provision and make sure that the law is narrowly tailored to prevent the actual crimes that occur in the digital realm. One of the other issues is that these cybercrime laws create duplicative penalties. Uh, for example, in Pakistan, in Cambodia, and I think even Tanzania, they had a specific provision of pornography or child pornography in their cybercrime law. But the punishment and the um, elements of the crime are different from the existing law already. And that creates an issue because the prosecutors or other judicial authorities have wide discretion under which of the two laws to prosecute an individual who's convicted or, or allegedly committed these crimes. So it's, it's better to have cybercrime laws that are, again, narrowly tailored to prevent specific crimes that are occurring in the digital realm and do away with the provisions that, um, let's say, make it a crime to say anything insulting about any parliamentarian. And because it's those broad provisions that can be interpreted in any way. Um, 
I think Egypt's new draft cybercrime law has a provision that prevents any false data from being disseminated. And Tanzania's cybercrime law that was passed last year is the same thing. And the question becomes, who decides what's false? And, and if that is left in some of the government's hands, um, you might have very true statements or opinions that are neither true nor false being prosecuted or individuals being prosecuted for, for stating those, those beliefs. Um, and the, so, so moving on to the, the second global trend, there is a push, seemingly, from most governments, uh, Western democracies, governments from the global south, and everywhere in between, to limit or ban the use of encryption. And as Ambassador Lester discussed, they're, they're, are, they are trying to stigmatize the use of encryption. And the way they do that is, essentially, they say, they frame the question of encryption as a question of security versus privacy. And I think civil society needs to articulate that this is a false choice. Encryption enhances security. And you can never have full personal safety without your personal data also being secure. And it's also important to note when we talk about encryption that everybody uses encryption every day. Almost every website you visit today or tomorrow or next week or next month is HTTPS. And basically that's an encrypted website. And nobody wants their credit card information, their passport numbers, date of birth, or other addresses, other identifying information, bank account numbers, to be completely thrown out into the open without being encrypted. So in truth, we use encryption every day and it enhances our security, both our personal safety and our private data. And so the choice is not uh, security versus privacy. It's a security versus security question. And I think there needs to be a similar push, a concerted effort from civil society and other groups to push back against this uh, false binary choice of security versus privacy. Encryption enhances our security and Simultaneously, we should give law enforcement the tools they need to do their job, but encryption keeps us all safe, and banning or limiting the use of that is going to make everybody less safe. The, the third global trend, I think, is a need for education. I'm finding, and ICNL is finding from local partners around the world, that individual Internet users just don't know what freedom of expression means, and that's as true in the United States uh, as it is in Thailand or Brazil. And it's a twofold problem. The first is that many of the individuals need to first know what international law says on freedom of expression, know what the limitations are. And one of the things that's important to note these days is that there is a right to offend under international law. That doesn't mean there's a duty to, do, to offend. But you have, you, an individual is able to say something that other people find offensive, and that is protected under international law. That doesn't mean they should go out and offend everybody at every corner, but there is a right to offend, though not a duty to offend. And, and that's just one example. So there needs to be a push to educate individuals on what international law means and how the ICCPR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, apply online. The second education bit is educating the individual individuals on what the domestic law says. Some countries it's a crime to insult parliamentarians. In other countries it's uh, a law to insult a head of another state. And so they need to know what they are allowed to say within their jurisdiction because that's the environment in which most of them operate. But it's equally important also <clears throat> during this education to point out which domestic laws and domestic regulations comply with or contradict with international law. People cannot exercise their freedom of expression, their right to privacy, their right to peaceful assembly or association if they don't know what that right means. 
So I think there really does need to be a global push to educate individual citizens on these rights, and I think civil society is, is well-placed to do that. Uh, a really interesting, um, and uh, I, I noticed uh, your three main points, uh, the trans uh, cybercrime laws, uh, your, your very forceful case uh, in favor of um, uh, uh, data encryption, and, and uh, finally, uh, the very important need for education, um, both on domestic and international law. And um, 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 so, so thank you very much for, for setting the stage for the discussion. Um, I would like to uh, then pass over to um, uh, Eon uh, and ask you, um, your organization actually was among several civil society organizations that uh, signed an appeal for revision of uh, uh, the law and um, 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 maybe you could uh, uh, provide us with an overview of how uh, the new uh, legal uh, provision will affect cyberspace in Moldova, and why are so many civil society organizations in Moldova uh, concerned about this uh, new amendment? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, we need to say that, uh, sorry for my English, you <laughs> have something wrong, okay? <laughs> uh, first of all, we need to, to say that um, uh, civil society is very active in Moldova, and civil society is very uh, uh, careful what our, our authorities do in this uh, area, I mean human rights. And uh, this tentative of our authorities to provide this kind of uh, uh, laws and norms is not uh, uh, fast. In 2013 they did, uh, uh, they uh, tried twice to, to implement something like this. And after that, um, in 2015, in the spring, they, they also <laughs> tried to do. But uh, every time, uh, civil society was very active. And um, i very surprised that after these three tentatives of our government and uh, very strong criticize uh, from um, civil society, and first argument of our colleagues was uh, lack of um, discussions. Uh, debates, public debates between authorities and civil society to uh, speak about this, to understand the position of authorities uh, and to understand the arguments of civil society and to find, uh, let's say, uh, golden middle. But uh, every time our authorities uh, keep silence and, uh, and very, very strange, uh, they again continue and insist uh, to, to provide this, uh, this law. Uh, of course, they uh, they try to motivate the uh, or adoption of this uh, this law uh, by the importance of preventing uh, uh, sex uh, sexual uh, child abuse and uh, terrorism related uh, uh, aspects to to terrorism. We understand all these problems. We agree. We need some um, some uh, specific regulation in this area. But we need uh, to discuss before adoption of the law and not after. So it's easier, it's uh, more civilized to to discuss before adoption of the law and not after. Um, except what Zach uh, mentioned about um, this um, um, problem, in Moldova we have specific aspects. We are young democracy. Uh, we have when only 25 of, let's say, democracy, but is not still is not democracy. This is a period of transition, uh, including the democ democratic aspects. But um, in this period, we uh, we still continue to, to discuss about uh, rules in rules and uh, procedures in the democracy, but uh, we still don't have a very good uh, justice system and procedures. We still have problems with reforms in the justice sector. So when we have lack of trust in justice system and the uh, government try to push this kind of uh, laws and norms. Of course, civil society will provide concerns. This is why uh, our situation is specific. 
and this is why we will insist to have very large de debates in the society before adoption. And uh, uh, our concern is also uh, based on experience. There are some cases, especially in Transnistrian region, uh, where constitutional authorities don't have uh, access and don't control this uh, territory. But this administration controls very well uh, civil society um, activity and including uh, um, internet. And we have some uh, examples when, uh, in trans from Transnistria region when uh, ci civil society activist was uh, uh, or suffered after uh, their actions. This is our, let's say, very short uh, position. Hmm. Uh, can, can you, um, um, if you're a little bit more specific about the, the, some of the legal provisions that have uh, uh, perhaps been those that worry you the most uh, from the civil society perspective, uh, yes, if you're a little bit more, more precise. Yes, uh, there are some risks of abuses, so procedures are not very clear, terms are not very clear. Uh, so in these conditions, and uh, what I mentioned, uh, when we have uh, lack of trust, full trust in in uh, in uh, justice sector, of course there there are a lot of risks to to have uh, political persecution or persecution against some uh, journalists, investigative journalists, or uh, control of NGOs and their activities. So we try to prevent this kind of um, uh, actions from the government side. And we consider that um, um, only after debates and very, very large debates in involving of the large uh, uh, number of uh, NGOs and uh, um, relevant uh, actors, we can uh, achieve a very good uh, uh, draft of the law. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Leon. Uh, uh, can I turn to Leonid? and uh, ask you uh, on what implications this law would have on a uh, civil society space and, and what specific elements to those uh, that are not familiar uh, with Moldova, those of our, our viewers and listeners who are not familiar, what specific elements in this law uh, would have a negative effect on civil society? Uh, if I may, I may turn to Leonid. Thank you, Ambassador Leisner. Thank you for the presentations of the short presentations of Yvonne and uh, Zach. Uh, it's indeed uh, difficult to speak the last one because some of the uh, issues were already raised, but I think it is very interesting thing to give uh, the perspective from uh, a person who has a rather uh, political science background. And I would say that um, the law is indeed uh, making uh, Moldovan democracy more vulnerable. Uh, since uh, you all mentioned basically that it was not discussed, and uh, the way a law is adopted can much can say very much about the purpose of the law. If it's adopted overnight and without having a public discussion on it, then of course uh, the law uh, uh, raises many questions. If it's adopted after a series of of discussion, then of course uh, the intentions could be uh, would be in favor of, let's say, of democratic development, but also in favor of uh, security versus security, as Zach put it. So basically, uh, my uh, my um, concern about this law is that uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, the proposal is written is in a such way that it could be uh, used in a discretionary manner or in arbitrary manner by the by the lawmakers and by the political incumbent. And this is the greatest risk, I think, of this law. Because you see in this law, I mean, I, I'm not a legal expert, but uh, it, one doesn't need to be a legal expert to understand that certain provisions are very um, ambiguous. Uh, and when I say ambiguous, I can give an example, for instance, uh, the authorities would be able to seize servers, uh, uh, or servers of, the, uh, of different media institutions or different people without having a, made a mandate from the judge, which I think is quite an important violation of the privacy, I mean, from my perspective. 
Uh, also, I think uh, uh, the monitoring in real time without the, the mandate of the court is also a, a big, big uh, question mark uh, on this on this issue. So I think that um, the proposal does not find a balance between the um, between the the interest followed by the institutions and the interest and the the comfort seen by the society. Uh, that is why I think that uh, uh, if the government wants indeed to convince uh, the civil society and the, the public at large basically about the usefulness of this law, then I think it should state very clear, clearly the procedures, first of all, and second, how this law will uh, to demonstrate the link to demonstrate the fact that this law will certainly improve the environment against, you know, sexual abuse, against terrorism, and so on and so on, but will not challenge the uh, rights which are guaranteed by the constitutions. I mean, the the, uh, uh, the right on privacy is guaranteed by constitutional model, and this is, I think, a serious thing. But I would like to maybe also add a little bit of flavor to our discussion and to which were not to speak, but to, to, to mention one fact. Uh, I have some, I have certain impression that uh, this law could be used also in the political, with, for political reasons, or to use for, uh, in order to gain some political uh, influence. Because if you look at the statistics, I mean, in 2013, just three years ago, uh, about 50% of the population was getting news from the internet and about 95 from TV. I mean, they, which means some of them simultaneously uh, paid attention to the ball. Well, now in 2016, we already have some uh, about 65% of the population who gets the news from the internet. So there is a, an, incre an increasing decentralization let's say, of the, of the news flows in Moldova, which is, of course, uh, um, you, you know, is creating some issues for the government because they are more fragile, more, um, it's easier to criticize them and it's easier to, to let the society know about their mistakes. So this is maybe precisely what we don't want to allow, to make uh, by using this law to make a little bit or to control the political discourse and the media flow and the news flow in Moldova. Because uh, uh, we've been having a boom in Moldova of investigative, investigative journalists and the results of this investigative journalist are usually, uh, you know, uh, uh, transferred or uh, are usually, the people are informed about these results by uh, internet, uh, web page, and so on, so not by classic media. <laughs> so I think that this is this is this is an important element as well. And the last, maybe uh, before the debate, is what I will have to say is that um, the risk of using this law for various reasons is very uh, uh, high because of the lack of procedure, I would underline this, uh, and uh, therefore we cannot believe in good intentions of the politicians. Of course we trust them in a way that they need to do their job in terms of, uh, you know, security, in terms of fighting against terrorism and so on and so on, but one, one cannot be sure about this until they do not engage into the public discussion and they reach a sort of well, more or less consensus within the society, especially within the uh, uh, experts in the in the in the area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonid. Um, um, uh, so now we we've um, uh, been touching on different aspects of uh, of this discussion, and um, um, I would like to address uh, maybe ask all of you to comment. Um, uh, well, first of all, is uh, what some uh, motivation to this law, um, of course, as, as always, is related to a perceived need for tightened security measures and uh, the difference, uh, the difficulty is naturally to find a strike a balance 
um, between that need and the protection of fundamental human rights. Um, and um, how, uh, um, how can one uh, strike that balance? Is there any uh, best practices? Uh, maybe, uh, Zach, uh, if you could uh, say a few words about uh, if, um, if um, there are best practices that do ensure uh, the protection of fundamental human rights uh, in cyberspace, uh, particularly against this uh, backdrop of, um, of uh, the need, uh, real or perceived, uh, for a tightened security. Sure. Uh, I think the I think the, the Council of Europe and the European Union is is really doing the best job thus far of promoting fundamental freedoms on the internet while finding that balance with security. And to the extent possible, I think countries even outside of Europe should be urged to follow the uh, Budapest Convention, which is the convention on, on cybercrime laws that the European Union and its member states have agreed to. I think that's a, a strong first step. Um, you know, the the other thing is, and I understand that this conversation is focused on, on cybercrime laws, but there are other laws that permit states to conduct widespread surveillance um, that often go unnoticed. Uh, and these are often provisions in telecommunications laws, um, or, or other national security devices. So there is a need to strike that balance and um, there, you know, I, I wish I could point to more best practices, but from a freedom of expression and right to privacy perspective, as, as you noted with Freedom House's report, the, it's a downward trend. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the things we can do is highlight the need for transparency. Yeah. And that's from both governments and private companies. Because the internet, 95% of it is owned and operated by private companies. And they have uh, different obligations with respect to human rights than governments do. Um, but they also, often also work in concert with governments. Because without government permission, they can't operate in an individual state. So um, there needs to be more transparency, and, and I think that that's a call that we can all help achieve, um, and that's everything from making sure uh, indiv individual private companies let their users know when their accounts are being shut down and for what reason, um, letting them know to the extent they're legally allowed to let them know when their individual user's account is being uh, surveilled by the state. And it also comes in transparency with the drafting and adoption of laws, which um, I think Lena touched on, that you know, civil society and the individuals, the citizens of states, are the stakeholders of these laws, and they should have a place at the table in terms of the drafting and debating the adoption of these laws. And it only, and so it's transparency. And I think some countries have done a better job than others. Um, so there needs to be, I think, a, a push for more transparency as well. Thank you, Zach. Uh, and um, uh, Ian and, um, uh, and Leonid, you both actually talk about the precisely uh, what uh, Zach uh, finished with talking about, uh, the lack of uh, uh, transparency and the need for civil society and other stakeholders to actually be involved uh, in the dis discussions running up to the law. And that this is uh, part of the issue here uh, in this particular case. And I. I particularly um, um, uh, noted down, uh, Leonid, what you say, that the way that the law is adopted says a lot about its, uh, its purpose, and I think that is valid for all countries. Uh, and um, um, there, there is perhaps a need for um, a wider discussion on best practices when it comes to the adoption of law and the participation of civil society in the preparation, the drafting process, and the round of remittances, etc. And so, um, uh, Ian, um, would you want to uh, maybe reflect on, on this? Just a few, a few words about this. In my opinion, uh, uh, I cannot understand why uh, authorities ignore to involve civil society because they have very good expertise, very, very good uh, uh, arguments. And they, uh, this is very good um, support for them to understand and to make very good laws. So if they ignore, 
this, we uh, uh, we have a right to accuse them that they have something uh, uh, hidden <laughs> um, plans or, uh, or or something like this. Uh, in general, generally speaking, I think uh, everybody knows that laws should be very preci precise, uh, very um, uh, clear, and uh, with very clear procedures and very clear uh, terms. Yeah, um, if we don't have these uh, elements, law will not will not be function. Uh, Will, will will not function and uh, the results will be very uh, bad for, for 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 them because through this we can avoid abuses. Thank you, Leon. Uh, Leonid. Yes, I just just a few words also to add. I think um, what Zach and Yvonne mentioned are very important uh, arguments, and uh, but I would add also that if I may, I would add also that uh, I think. It's very important how the society reacts. Parties maybe from the opposition because this also could be targeted at some point of this poll. Uh, I mean, by accident in a way, or not directly. And I think that, that this is uh, it's important how they react first. And I think that uh, the reaction of the civil society uh, in Moldova when this law was proposed was was quite prompt and uh, it was heard. I think this this is important. Second, if it's not heard, then uh, of course maybe certain um, protests could take place. I mean, just to let the people, let the uh, not the people, but the authorities know that we know what they do, and we uh, it shouldn't be a mass protest. It's just we can go and you know mention what that we disagree, not with the law or the idea of the law, but with the fact that it's passed without the public consultation. And the third thing, I think we need to also make use of the instruments which we have uh, in our possession uh, now. I think we are, uh, we, could, we could certainly ask for the expertise from the side of the Council of Europe. Council of Europe or, or Venice Commission, for uh, yeah, the, the so-called Venice Commission, uh, which is uh, making, uh, is preparing opinions, ex expert opinions on the important laws that shall be adopted. Uh, I think this is one of the elements which also should be should be used. So uh, let's say, I mean, if we cannot agree, both of us, I mean, on the one side, civil society, and on the other side, the government, let's ask for, uh, for, uh, for the good offices, yeah, for, for, the, for the Council of Europe. And then uh, certainly we have the fourth one, if we find allies among the politicians, when in the in Moldova, for instance, the MPs are entitled to ask the constitutional court to check whether a law is constitutional or not. So we, we should also use these instruments because yes, why do we have we might have a government which is not entirely committed to uh, you know to abide by the democracy rules, but we certainly have certain uh, stakeholders in the parliament, certain actors, certain MPs who are. Uh, much more, uh, who have a propensity to hear the civil society, and they could actually ask the constitutional court to check this. So I think we need to use both political, in a way, or civil society instruments, and also legal instruments. Thank you, Leonid. Um, uh, going back to the issue of, of uh, the intentions, uh, intention of, of the law, uh, and this law, and, and similar laws, to um, actually increase security in order to prevent uh, or deter threats uh, and criminal activity I would like uh, before I would like to ask Zach uh, if uh, there are um, any examples of where this type of increased security actually has helped um, uh, deter criminal activity before uh, before it's implemented that's, a, that's an excellent question um, and I am unfortunately not in uh, uh, the best position <laughs> to answer that. Um, I think uh, a number of states and government authorities, um, ones that come to mind are uh, the US, Australia, France, and the UK, have uh, claimed, in some cases very convincingly, in other cases perhaps less so, um, that the increased security measures via cybercrime laws or uh, surveillance acts 
have halted terrorist attacks or, or other attacks and crimes before um, they, you know, before they were committed. So I think there is evidence of that. Um, but I, you know, again, it, it, it goes back to to the balance of um, protecting these fundamental rights uh, versus increased security. And so, and and as Leonid and Ian talked about, it's about um, how the law is implemented. And you know, I think one of the one of the good examples that's relevant today is. Um, the satirist or comedian who's being prosecuted or is being investigated in Germany um, because he insulted a head of state. Now that law has been on the books in Germany since the late 1800s, but I believe very few of any prosecutions have gone forward, at least in modern times. But when these sort of, um, when these countries, especially the Western democracies that we often look to as the good examples. When they have laws like these on the books, it gives an opening for more, um, or for, it gives an opportunity for other governments, more dictatorial regimes or less democratic regimes, if you will, to adopt similar laws. And you know, one of the one of the great things about a country like Germany with a very sophisticated good independent judicial system is that the prosecutor gets a lot of discretion about which cases to prosecute and can make that, and judges can also make that determination on the balance between the freedom of expression and the letter of the law. But it opens up the doors for countries where there is not an independent judiciary to adopt a similar law and then implement it in a way that is not fair and not independent and is used to stifle dissent. So, um, you know, yes, there there are certainly examples where increased security measures have led to the halting of attacks before they happen, and the arrest of individuals who are plotting terror attacks. Um, but I think, on balance, there have also been a wide range of violations of fundamental freedoms, including the right to privacy and freedom of expression, and freedom of association. And so, the, it it really just comes back to to that balance and. Um, there aren't easy answers in this. I, I, you know, everybody from the the UN Special Rapporteur is on freedom of expression. Uh, David Kay is arguing, or not arguing, is wrestling with this same balance, and it's it's a difficult question. But security comes with being able to feel secure in your private communications. That is a that's an important element of security that people need to remember. Yeah, thank you very much, Zach. And uh, and uh, I think that it um, uh, it really highlights uh, the issue. One of the issues that we're trying to address within the community of democracies is the link between democracy and security. Uh, and uh, in less than two weeks, we will actually launch an initiative that is going to be led by Madeleine Albright and uh, um, uh, former Prime Minister Joma from from Tunisia. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to this, and I will definitely make sure that uh, the content of this discussion is, is uh, uh, channeled to, to those working with us, because I, I believe that this is a very important part of, of the issue. Um, uh, now, um, uh, if you were, I would like to ask all three of you, uh, if you were to meet with uh, one of the members of the parliament in Moldova, um, what would your more precise message be to him or her? Uh, what parts of the law would you want them to review and possibly uh, redraft? Who's first out? Ian? Uh, probably for me is uh, simple. Is very simple to to answer to this question because uh, I. Um, uh, I need to communicate to you bec uh, that uh, we have good result in this area. <clears throat> the president of the parliament promised pub publicly that uh, he will uh, invite civil society and he will open uh, public debates. So we uh, expect, we wait for, for this invitation and uh, we hope that uh, from this moment uh, everything will be uh, in uh, norm with these problems. Uh, what we will ask, probably we will uh, work very hard, uh, article by article, uh, 
to to provide very good law to provide very good procedures to avoid some abuses and to, to avoid some problems uh, for for human rights and uh, to be sure that human rights will be respected uh, in this uh, procedure in uh, and uh, process uh, which mean uh, terrorism fighting with oh. terrorism and so on thank you very much uh, Leonid Yes, if I may add a few things, I mean, you won't mention probably the most important, yeah, the, the debates, but I also like to, if I would have this opportunity to talk to the MPs who are, um, who can influence or who can, who, who, who have an impact on the law, I would say that it's quite important to provide statistics. I mean, because the current law is, uh, you know, the arguments on which is built on is, are very weak. This is a sort of discretionary analysis without pr proving, without giving data, you know. Saying like, look, I mean, we had this number of cases where we could have prevented if we had this law in place. There's no something like this. So I think this is the weak, a very weak argumentation. That's why we don't kind of believe in, in into this. I mean, so I think the, the arguments, this is the first thing. And second is that um, if this law would be adopted in, in the future, then it shouldn't be uh, in the control of one person. Mm -hmm. so it shouldn't be uh, discretionary in a way that it's one person who takes the decision, but we monitor this person or that person without having you know, a mandate or without having a co-decision. So, so just to avoid discretionary and arbitrary actions in the, uh, of, of the people who have the controls of this law, the, the remote control of this law. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Leonid. Uh, and uh, Sak, uh, would you have a message? Um, well, I would have a message, but I, I must preface my message by saying that I have not had a chance to review the law in full. Um, but my message to parla parliamentarians is to really um, let them know what the effect of the law will be, uh, not just in the short term, but also in the long term. Uh, many parliamentarians, and this has happened everywhere, is they see the law, it looks very good on paper, um, but they don't quite know or haven't, just haven't had the time to think about the long term effect that this will have. And so it's really highlighting those areas where one individual um, is able to undertake a number of, of actions without judicial oversight and what that might mean in the future for them or their constituents. Um, or we, people mentioned how this law could affect the media and to highlight the importance of having a good independent media that is a bit of a government watchdog and how this law will prevent that. And I think it's equally important, as well as addressing parliamentarians, but reaching out and educating those groups who will be most affected by this law about its impact. Um, and there's a great example from Pakistan and their Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act, which is currently being debated. The media had no idea that this law was even in draft form, let alone what its effect would be. And civil society was able to reach out and gather media groups and go through the provisions that were going to affect their work directly and their livelihood. And the media groups were then able to stand with civil society and go to their parliamentarians and go to their senators and say, this provision needs to be amended, this provision needs to be amended, or we can't do our jobs, we won't be able to feed our families. And more importantly, or at equally importantly, uh, freedom of expression will be restricted. So it's, I think it's equally important to reach out to parliamentarians and educate them on the long-lasting effect of this law, uh, but it's also important to reach out to concerned, or the groups who are most concerned or who, who will be most affected by the law as well. Thank you very much, Zach. Uh, so uh, can I ask uh, the LEM members now, are you, are you uh, reaching out to um, uh, stakeholders such as parliamentarians or 
uh, civil society organizations or so forth. I understand, Ian, that uh, there is going to be an invitation from the government to discuss. That might be uh, such a good opportunity. Yes. So um, uh, that is, uh, I think it really sounds like a very important step forward. Uh, and um, uh, I assume that, uh, that you would continue to push for that. Of course, uh, but many, many things depend on, uh, on uh, civil society. And I will repeat, uh, we have very good uh, civil society organizations. Our colleagues from other NGOs are very active in different areas, including uh, justice uh, reforms. And uh, they, uh, or we, uh, different organizations, uh, when they uh, observe some problems or some uh, 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 situations which are not very, very um, in, in, in uh, conform with uh, um, rules, uh, immediately we uh, call each other and uh, we started to write some appeals or uh, public documents and put, push, uh, put pressure on our authorities to stop. And uh, these uh, situations are very successful for, for civil society. And I, uh, I am convinced that uh, this kind of uh, collaboration and partnership between uh, the civil society organizations is very efficient. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And Leonid, what can you do as a LAN member? Yeah, I think uh, what I will do as a land member, well, certainly I will join the, the initiatives or maybe I'll initiate something. I'm not, uh, uh, the, I, I don't know, but uh, what I think it's important is to highlight if I would be able to be part of this dialogue with the government, with, I mean, with the, with the government, with the MPs, I would highlight that um, the consultations are indeed very important, this is the first step, but the second step is to take into account the opinions of the civil society and the public at large about how this law should look like. I mean, or uh, take into account the, the, the risks or the, the, yeah, the opinion of the civil society, because, it, it, I mean, maybe you won't have a better cooperation with the government and they had a 100% uh, you know uh, uh, cooperation but uh, I had uh, while I was part of the National Participation Council which was a advisory body to a civil society advisory body to the uh, government of Moldova it was quite often when the government organized consult consultations they heard uh, what you wanted to say, what one wanted to say, but then in the end they didn't take into account uh, our opinion. So I think here is the risk because they they can they can say that you know we we heard what you say, uh, we have but but others said this and you know we think that uh, we got more opinions which back up actually our arguments and not yours. So that's why I mean we did we we did consult the, the public opinion the civil society. But we still remain on the same positions as we did on the beginning, so on and so on. So I think this is quite important. We don't need only a meeting, but we also need um, a say on the on the letter of the, the law, let's say. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, uh, actually, I think that you all, in different ways, have responded to the question I intended to have as the last question. What can civil society do to uh, protect human rights in cyberspace? Uh, and, and Zach, I think that you were um, uh, very, um, uh, very clear in, uh, in that, and particularly the role of education, uh, that uh, you started out making the point of uh, the importance of education um, of the uh, civil society groups and, and others, and, and uh, um, make um, um, uh, create awareness um, at the different levels, and um, uh, that this is a very important role of the civil society. Uh, and uh, um, Eon, uh, you have also emphasized the importance of this, and, and as well Leonid, uh, the importance of the process um, uh, that is um, perhaps fundamental in in this case and in all other cases, actually, regardless of of uh, what law it would be, but the role of civil society and the necessity for civil society to somehow find its way to have uh, a part in the discussion 
running up to the uh, to the drafting and, and and the adopting of a law. And um, uh, here, I believe there is, and this is my personal um, um, opinion, that there is a lack of clear uh, best international practices. Uh, for the involvement of civil society in the drafting processes of new laws, be it on, on uh, um, freedom of um, expression and cyberspace issues or any other issue. Um, and um, then uh, you have also mentioned uh, the importance to, uh, uh, to use um, uh, existing international legislation, uh, the possibility in this case to access uh, uh, the expertise of the Council of Europe and so forth, uh, which might also be a specific area where civil society has a, a particular role to play to uh, uh, to uh, uh, create awareness of of uh, these possibilities. Um, um, it, so I, I would just uh, like to to um, give you a space if you want to make any co concluding remark on this uh, general issue on on the role of civil society when it comes to protection of human rights in cyberspace. Uh, who's first out, Ian? Okay, uh, from my perspective, uh, the most uh, important element here uh, is human rights defenders. If we will have in our societies, in our countries, a good and very active uh, professional uh, human rights defenders and uh, uh, human rights organizations, uh, everything uh, can be under, under control. If we will not fight for these human rights activists, uh, people will be discouraged to be active, to be to fight for democracy, to fight for their rights and their freedoms. And uh, I know this from our society, from our country, because uh, uh, there are some situations when human rights defenders need this support from international uh, actors, from international partners. And uh, yes, we have very good, uh, let's say, norms and uh, rules and. Uh, uh, documents at the international uh, level, international uh, documents, I mean, but they are ignored or they uh, sometimes um, used very diplomatically in, in very uh, uh, different political um, uh, games between some uh, actors, countries, uh, diplomats, and so on. So the most important element from my point of view, I will, I will repeat, is human rights and their security, human rights defenders and their security. Excellent point, Leon. Thank you very much. Uh, Leon, uh, Leon? I think uh, that the ICT, I mean, the, the, uh, the communication tools based on internet will, will um, the pressure on, on this will increase in the future, I think, because as, as uh, I mentioned there is an increasing influence of the internet-based media and so on uh, in the political life of Moldova. So uh, we should, one should be ready to uh, cope with this. But as a civil society, maybe one last uh, remark which I can make is that I think uh, if we want to be successful, is uh, that then we need to make very clear what could be the outcomes, the negative outcomes especially, of this kind of law. For, for, for me, for you want, and for many, many other people, I mean, the public at large, uh, the personal data revealed, uh, you know, um, so this kind of big bravo law, we don't need it. I mean, in this, in this way as it is. So I think one of the best ways to show this negative outcomes which can, which could, could uh, appear at some point if this law is adopted. And here I support uh, entirely what Zach mentioned, that we need an assessment what would be the uh, short-term uh, efficiency results of this law, mid-term and long-term, so we know that we adopt a law which is serving the interest of uh, security, privacy, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much, Leonid. Zach? Uh, I think civil society can do four things, or there are four things that I think are most important for civil society. Push, first, uh, participation. Push for participation in the drafting and adoption process of all laws, especially those that affect fundamental freedoms. The second, transparency. Push for transparency in not only the drafting of the laws, but the motivation behind the laws, and uh, as you mentioned, 
ambassador Leisner, um, when these laws have prevented acts. Let's, let's be transparent on both sides, from private companies to governments. Uh, the third is education. Educating citizens on their rights, educating parliamentarians on their rights, and their obligation to uphold and protect those human rights. Um, and also uh, come up with best practices and what good cybercrime laws that are narrowly tailored to address the issues look like. And the final one is to lead by example. Uh, be outspoken, be transparent, and be on the forefront of pushing for participation, transparency, and education. And I think civil society is well-placed to do all of those things. Thank you very much, Zach. And thank you to all three of you. Um, um, uh, Ion, who initiated the discussion, uh, Leonid, our dedicated LEN member, and, and Zach, our uh, very, very interesting expert from ICNL. You have really enriched uh, the, the discussion. I, uh, I think that uh, uh, this has been a very, very useful um, uh, webinar, and um, I thank you all very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.